first day of UCL Women's Week, we're doing something slightly different this evening. Um, we're going to be writing some comedy, and we've got a fantastic lineup of two comedians for you this evening. And um, before we begin, we'd just like to thank both Hallie and Kate for coming this evening. Um, so I guess we should introduce ourselves um, and tell you a bit more about the group which this event's named after. Um, my name is Alex, <coughs> and I'm Harriet. Um, and we're both medical students here at UCL and members of the Bula Bulba, uh, a student action group um, that set up the campaign and raise awareness against female genital mutilation, or FGM. So why did we decide to get involved in this group? Well, at the start of this year of medical school, which is our fifth year, <coughs> our whole cohort of medical students was shown a film about FGM. Um, and the harrowing nature of the subject matter and the honesty of the film really had a profound effect on us all. And I can't remember another session at medical school having quite such an effect. Um, then I did my gynaecology placement and I met many survivors of FGM. And I realised that more often than not, doctors just didn't have the right words to discuss this important, important issue with patients. So it was these two experiences which led me to becoming involved with the group. Um, so I've known about FGM for quite a few years now, but never really come across a way in which I can sort of get involved and make a difference to try and raise awareness about the practice um, until I heard about people involved And being part of the group gives us, as medical students, a voice not only to um, discuss FGM with patients and doctors, uh, but also to improve wider public awareness about the practice. We want to be the kind of doctors who are confident to talk to women about FGM and who aren't afraid to confront issues in um, everyday clinical practice. Um, so the group started quite small, but this year has really grown in size with the help of our founder, Dr. Jane Gardner. <coughs> um, and our most recent initiative, which actually began yesterday, sees groups of medical students going into local colleges to deliver interactive workshops on um, sexual health, consent, body image, and also FGM. Um, so now we're four days into uh, the week's programme here at UCL. Uh, and it's mark the International Women's Day, which is this Sunday, the 8th of March. Um, and we just thought it would be a bit crazy with a group called Viva La Vulva. Um, we just had to get involved with a name like that. So here we are. <laughs> so everyone's been asking us why we decided to do a comedy event. Well, being a woman in the 21st century, um, there are challenges. <coughs> um, and for some of you who've been to the events this week, I'm sure you'll agree that millions of women across the globe um, face persecution and prejudice simply because of their gender. However, this isn't the whole story, and there is much to celebrate about being a woman, and I'm sure you'll all agree much to laugh about too. So we thought I'd, uh, we'd remind ourselves of this by holding this comedy event. Um, we're going to be hearing from two comedians, Callie Beaton and Kate Smurthwaite. Um, before we introduce our first set, we're going to invite you all to a reception afterwards because we are having drinks at the Marlborough Arms um, on Torrington Place, which is just around the corner. Um, and it'd be great to see those of you there to continue the evening. Um, we'll also be putting a map up uh, on the screen at the end to give you instructions how to get there. <laughs> so without further ado, we're delighted to welcome to the stage our opening act, Callie Beaton. Callie worked in television production for many years before taking up stand-up comedy in 2014. Since then, she has been extensively in London, also in New York and Miami, um, and now she's come to Gower Street. So, Here. And I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't mind if 
playing several, second fiddle. Uh, I've got two kids, actually, so I'm used to that. Uh, never, never in the line. Have right? you got any other parents in? Yeah, yeah that's what you get at the lower level, like, oh, we're surprised we made it. The babysitter turns up, knackers, do our best, yeah. But I know the rest of you are going to be whooping and cheering, and part of my job is to get the energy up so that when the lovely Kate Smurthway hits the stage, you are so excited, you're laughing at everything, you're in the zone, so the more you warm up with me, the more quickly I'll get off and let you see who you've come here to see. Okay, <laughs> that deal? So, uh, so yeah, I mentioned my, uh, my two kids. I've got two lovely kids. I've got a boy and a girl. And, uh, and their dad is Dutch. I met him when I was uh, living in Amsterdam. And uh, on my birthday, a couple of years ago, as a special surprise, he told me he was leaving me for their primary school teacher. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Nor did she. <laughs> and I won't lie to you, that was not a great day. <laughs> but, uh, but not as bad a day as last week, when my kids, who are teenagers now, decided to post a picture on Facebook of my vibrator when they found it in my sock. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that the sitcom of my life is writing itself. <laughs> but uh, I'm not here for sympathy, and actually I have a very happy, if a little bit unusual, blended family life now. So, uh, so my kid's dad is now happily settled, and he's had a new baby of his own. Uh, and we live very nearby each other and we're very sort of blended and we do things together and our family unit, which is a slightly unusual one, is me, my two teenage kids, my ex, the little toddler and Miss Jenkins. <laughs> We're the talk of the neighbourhood. We're very happy as we are. And we've decided to bring the kids up, you know, I think it's important to bring them up collaboratively and amicably. And we also bring them up bilingually. So uh, they learn everything that they need to for dual citizenship. So, you know, they're fluent in, in spoken Dutch and they're fluent in written Dutch. And they're all confidently able to roll a joint in front of a police officer. <laughs> which is an important skill, and we're very, we're very proud of them. <laughs> but, uh, and my son, my son was diagnosed uh, a few years ago with Asperger's syndrome, with, with high-functioning autism. Um, I mean, my daughter's got her challenges too. In fact, it's been, a, it's been a very difficult time for the whole family ever since she developed an obsession with One Direction. <laughs> so, you know, that has been tough. <laughs> As if life hasn't dealt me enough One Direction. <laughs> Okay. But my son's IQ is, is 160, which puts him in the sort of genius category. And uh, in terms of, you know, um, to sort of explain what he's like, you know that character in Rain Man? Does anyone remember that brilliant Dustin Hoffman character? And my son's like that, you know, he's a mathematical genius. But you can imagine it can be really hard when your own child can't let you hug him. But all of that sort of melts away when you look across at your first ball and you see him pulling out your tax return for you. Spins and roundabouts, ladies and gentlemen. You take the hand of life to it, you do. So here I am, single again. And you know, it takes a bit of adjustment when you find yourself single unexpectedly at my, at my stage in life. And I guess one of the biggest adjustments I had to make was getting used to the fact that I'm having loads more sex than I did when I was married. <laughs> so, uh, that's been an important challenge. <laughs> and then there's the, uh, there's the question, isn't there, uh, of who to have sex with? And I think that's an important one. Uh, and I, I put some time and energy into that, and I think that's a good thing to think about. And, uh, and I've realised that I've become, I've become a little bit picky about what I look for in a man. And it's a bit like, you know when you go to a coffee shop and I go in and I go up to the counter and I say I'd like my mocha chocker soya decaf 
latte with extra milk, please, and I expect my coffee to come as I want it, when I want it, and I want that coffee right now like that. And I expect men to be a bit exactly what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I like, do I want cinnamon, do I want chocolate? I'm like that with men, so I'm like, well, do you know, uh, on the one hand, I want a man who's, you know, who's funny, uh, and on the other hand, I want a man who's serious. <laughs> And uh, on the, one, the other hand, I want, you know, I want a man who's, you know, who's strong. But I also want a man who's weak. <laughs> <laughs> and I want a man who's emotionally available. But please don't cry during sex. <laughs> and you know, the last time that men were wholeheartedly applauded for having that sort of old-fashioned throwdown factor in the bedroom, that was in the 90s. And those men, well, they've all hit middle age now. And they've, and they've put their backs out. And, uh, they've retrained as reflexologists. And I've got as much chance of finding one of them as I have of seeing a unicorn bowling down Good Street, to be honest with you. And what I'm really looking for in a man, I think it's quite simple. I'd like someone who, on the one hand, has read Kaplan Moran's How to Be a Woman, and on the other has all the merchandise from Fifty Shades of Grey. And that is a very elusive combination of tales. So I'm going to let you into a secret, a little secret, just between ourselves, which is lately, I've had a go at dating women. <laughs> Not least, because I think the only acceptable outcome of this hot young primary school teacher situation is for me to end up with Miss Jenkins. <laughs> It's, it's 
rewarding. <laughs> about it being a liberating feminist act. But it's also just a question of time, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, all those hours that I would have spent waxing it to within an inch of its life, <laughs> I've decided I'm going to invest those hours in pursuits previously reserved exclusively for men. So, you know, that might be being a FTSE 100 board member. <laughs> the other person's orgasm as long as I've had mine. <laughs> so uh, I don't think there's any better place to leave anything than on the female orgasm. So I'm going to end on that note. And uh, I want you to thank yourselves, give yourselves a round of applause for being a lovely audience for me. I've been Callie Beaton. <laughs> someone who is big brained, inspirational, hilarious. Please give it up, clap loud and hard for the one, the only, Kate Smurfway.
succeeded, I would be holding it aloft now, wouldn't I? <laughs> and that might sound really harsh, especially if you don't really know Melanie Phillips. Uh, but so let me tell you about Melanie Phillips. Uh, this is a classic Daily Mail piece from Melanie Phillips. The real reason our hospitals are a disgrace. A disgrace, and I'm guessing that we've got quite a few people in here uh, who are involved in medicine, one way or another, whether you're students or professionals, or whether you've just been to the doctors at some point, you've probably got... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just, it's just a couple there going, no, we've still got the tonsils and the adenoids. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you've all got some ideas on how we can improve the health service. Actually, I've got one. Fund it. <laughs> eroded by modern feminism. <laughs> Did anybody else miss that meeting? <laughs> we thought we were dealing with, with rape culture and a pay gap. I really did. <laughs> but happy afternoon off, we fucked the health service. <laughs> but I have to be fair, I have to be fair, let's just find out why she's so angry with the health service. Well, Right? My mum was in hospital and she didn't like the treatment that her mum got. Well, that would make me angry too. I get that. I get that. Maybe she was given the wrong medicine. Maybe she was kept waiting, right? Let's just check what went wrong with Melanie Phillips' mum. <laughs> My mother was addressed discourteously. <laughs> I 
mediums do. I must immediately cross out any joke I've ever written uh, that, that covers those subjects and never talk about, about them again. And it's taken me a long time to realise that actually I know loads of male comics who talk about shitting and spunking and vomiting, and I'm not aroused by their stories. I'm just interested if they're funny. I'm happy to laugh along. You don't have to. You don't have to find the subject matter appealing to like the joke. Um, and so, but, and so that's my little preface to this, to, to what I'm going to say, which is that I know we've got lots of people in the room, as I say, who are involved in medicine in one way or another, and, um, and there are subjects that we don't talk about enough, and there's information I would like to impart to medical professionals. Uh, most of the people in this room, uh, most because we are more women than men, uh, most of the people in this room will, in the last few years, have been for a smear test. Um, guys, you might be a bit behind. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you've never been, I'll just, I'll just quickly to describe it, uh, you're, you're naked from the waist down, you've got your feet up, perhaps in, in stirrups or something, hopefully you're at the doctor's. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not, sort that out. <laughs> and, uh, and all the women in the room know what I'm going to say. The doctor says the least helpful thing that one human being can possibly say to another human being at that moment in time, which is... Yes. That. Yes. <laughs> Relax. Uh, I don't know if this makes me a bad person, but I say, from experience, it helps if you tell me I'm pretty. <laughs> I've, I've also introduced two new words in talking about money first. I've introduced two new words, as it were, that I feel I should address. So first of all, I've used the word feminism. Uh, and I do describe myself as a feminist, but I know, I know, when I use the word feminist, there's, there, there, there's always a little bit, there's always somebody who slightly flinches, and quite often I have a wonderful conversation with somebody afterwards where they say, oh now listen, listen, look, I am all in favour of equality, but could you, could you just not use that word? And I'm like, well, well, that's sort of what the word means, right? That's, that's sort of, that's a little bit like going, look, I love hardened milk, but could you not say cheese? <laughs> I do understand, I do understand what they're talking about, because unfortunately people like Melanie Phillips, uh, you know, that, that they, they distort what words mean, you know, they change the meaning of these words by accusing us of destroying their health service and this kind of stuff. Um, and, and over a period of time, the sort of accepted meaning of the word can change. And, and so I, I empathise, if people are sort of starting to become uncomfortable with the word feminist, maybe it's time to, to you know, to, to move on and use some different terminology. And, and actually that's fine, I'm happy to stop calling myself a feminist, because I much prefer the term radical cunt building patriarchism. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the other word I've used, of course, is cunt. Uh, a couple of times now. Um, and uh, and I, I, some, I'm sorry, I apologise in advance. Some people don't really like the word, and I really do. So, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I mean, I have a choice, right? I could, I could instead use the word vagina, couldn't I? But I don't know. Uh, if anyone has studied languages, the word vagina comes from a Latin term that means a sheath for keeping a sword in. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Hackney, it's, it's a nice prime area. Whereas <laughs> <laughs> cunt is an old English word that means triangle. Right? <laughs> and I quite like the, the idea that it's not just sort of one orifice, it's a whole area of features and attractions. <laughs> yeah. uh, it must be said also, I, I say I like the word cunt, but you'll notice that I don't use it as an insult, I use it anatomically. A lot of political comics that I work with say things like David Cameron's a cunt, Jewel Josborn is a cunt, and I'm not comfortable with that, I'm not comfortable with that because I think that that's an insult to cunts. <laughs> Um, about my pubes. 
Um, and uh, good news for uh, Cammy, uh, the answer to you, what should you do with your pubes? Uh, the Guardian and I have sorted this shit out. <laughs> oh, no, I don't know. Oh, hang on. Oh, am I doing this wrong? Oh, I'm pushing this one up. Oh, that's it. There we go. It's the year of the bush! <laughs> uh, this article, uh, published last year in The Guardian, claims that pubic hair is back, back in fashion, thanks to me <laughs> and Cameron Diaz. <laughs> She rang me up and went, hey Kate, I'm thinking about not waxing. <laughs> hey Cams. Um, <laughs> this, this is what they're publishing in The Guardian, and they haven't got time for a view my fucking show. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, so here's the story that they tell. The story that they tell is this. Apparently, a few years ago, it was fashionable to have the Brazilian wax. Um, I didn't really know anything about it. I've never been interested in this sort of thing. Uh, I grow it long, consider it a feature. Um, the Brazilian wax was fashionable for a while. I found out about it this way. My sister, um, apparently, is one of these women who likes to have a Brazilian wax. She went on holiday uh, to China. They did this sort of, took a couple of months off work and did this sort of, you know, sort of sabbatical, taking a long holiday, her and her, her other half, before they started having a family. And, um, and while she was in China, she decided to go and get her wax job redone. She went to a salon in rural China and said, could you please rip my pubes out by the roots? <laughs> and they thought she was having a breakdown. <laughs> she was determined, shall we say. Uh, so she starts acting things out, drawing pictures, miming, offering US dollars, all the kind of stuff that you do. Uh, these sort of patronising, slow English and gestures. She did all that kind of stuff, and eventually they said, OK, we'll do it. But just to clarify, should we remove all of the hair? And she said, oh, no, 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 no. I don't know how, how many experts we've got in, but no, 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 no. Uh, if you remove it all, that's called a Hollywood. <laughs> Information, yes. Uh, uh, you've got to leave, the Brazilian, you leave a little strip, a little strip uh, down the middle. Uh, now, this is true, right? She looked down afterwards. And they had left a horizontal strip. <laughs> I get no entry sign or something. Uh, obviously, the jazz is the female version. There is a male version. 
uh, and it's called a pen hassle. <laughs> Which is such a wasted opportunity, isn't it? I mean, marketing-wise, that should be called decoration. <laughs>
at it in the distance. <laughs> people are heterosexual, it's a, it's, a, it's a rude thing to do and, and you will get tripped up at 
at some point, quite possibly, uh, in a way that, that actually puts you rather in danger, it turns out, in this case. But, <laughs> needless to say, this is what the Daily Mail is going to do. In its article, explaining how female orgasm works for all our benefits. <laughs> for decades, goodness knows how we shagged before decades. <laughs> satisfaction. This meant men who wanted to satisfy their partners believed that they must spend <coughs> hours <laughs>
response, and you don't have to be directly affected by something to campaign about it, and nor does it have to be the world's worst problem for you to campaign about it. You can just all be a part of it. Um, but this, this message of like which women should or shouldn't be campaigning about FGM and about these issues, I sort of think that maybe we should have an afternoon where all the women in the world just take an afternoon off dealing with whole, this whole issue, and all the men in the world get together, and half of them explain to the other half where the fuck it is, <laughs> and that half explained that why you shouldn't cut the damn thing off. <laughs> women could have a bloody relax, couldn't we? We could do our nice uh, birthday spa treatment or whatever it is, and, uh, and do something else. So that, that's, that would be as much as I will say that's sort of like really uh, sort of addressing that issue. But uh, now let's talk about something that perhaps is a little bit related. So I did a benefit. Um, I've had something I'm bragging, doesn't it? Hey everyone, I do a lot of charity work. Um, I did a benefit a couple of months ago uh, at the Rooms Theatre just around the corner um, uh, for a charity called Brooks. And how many of you know Brooks? Well, Brooks, some of you know Brooks, yeah. Um, well, you see, because you're sat in the lecture theatre, you put your hands up. How very polite. <laughs> I'd be like, well, you've got lines after class, good. Um, uh, so I did it, and, and, and uh, like, I feel like I'm bragging. It's, it, it, right, I, I, I do benefits when there's good causes, great, yes, yes, yes. This one, when you do a benefit, and this, this, this makes me sound the opposite of bragging, this makes me sound horrible, when you do a benefit, they usually give you a little present. Like a bottle of wine or a box of chocolates, it's not why I do it, I do it for the kids, alright? <laughs> but they usually give you a little thank you, you know, it's just toiletries or chocolates or something. The sex appeal thing, it's a, it's a benefit for Brooke, and uh, for those who don't know, Brooke is a sex advice helpline for young people. So sort of roughly what would happen, I'm looking around, there's, oh, there's loads of young people, you guys, you would ring up and you'd be like, oh, I sat on the toilet seat and it was a bit sticky, and they go, don't worry, it's not as bad as you think. <laughs> They are, the, the show, the, the charity show, is sponsored by a company called Love Honey. Uh, and some of you, I can tell from your eyebrows, know about Love Honey. I don't mean, they don't sell waxing uh, or popping equipment. I mean, uh, I can tell from whether your eyebrows popped up at that moment. Uh, so if you don't know them, Love Honey uh, are an online sex toy retailer. Um, and so I feel like, I, I, I want to name check them because it seems kind of appropriate. Uh, you know, they sponsor the goodie bags that the acts get. Um, at the sex appeal gig, and so it seems kind of appropriate that in that context I should take the opportunity to give them a plug. Mm. <laughs> um, and yes, as a thank you for doing the sex appeal gig, we get a bag of sex toys from Love Honey. If you haven't heard of Love Honey, um, you might recognise it because they've got these adverts on TV now that I slightly adore. Uh, where you see a middle-aged couple sat on a sofa, and the bloke goes, well, we were really pleased at how discreet the packaging was. <laughs> <laughs> the neighbours have no idea. <laughs> this is ITV! <laughs> I think the whole gimbal thing is out of the bag now. <laughs> now, um, I think it's about the fourth year running I've done the Sex Appeal gig. Uh, and I've had some, some wonderful moments over the years um, uh, going through what's in the bag and, and trying to figure out what it is. And, the, and every time you open the bag, you kind of, sometimes you go, oh, brilliant, I've always wanted to try one of those. And sometimes you go, what is that? Which way around would you? I don't understand. Um, and this year, there was something in the bag, which I must confess, I've never, I've, I've heard of this thing, but I've never thought that I wanted one of these or that I was interested in. I never thought, all oh, that sounds sexy. It just isn't something that appeals to me. Uh, but nonetheless, this year, in the bag, <laughs> a pair of edible knickers. <laughs> now, as I said, I've never really wanted, I've never really wanted a pair of edible knickers. It doesn't really appeal to me uh, as, a, as a fun thing to have or to do. But the trouble with this is, it's very difficult to re-gift it, isn't it? <laughs> information. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of did have some 
questions on that in that respect. Um, and uh, of course, if you know how nutritional information works, it says number of calories per 100 grams. Um, and then it says number of calories per serving. <laughs>
that people are having. So most of the sex and the sex is on TV would be on channels like MTV. Typically, you know, what happens, a guy comes on, he starts singing, um, and uh, then about, just when he gets to the good bit of the song, you know, two women appear either side of him in bikinis. <laughs> Between you and I, I'm not sure they're really lesbians. Um, <laughs> that they are supposed to be masturbating. <laughs> oh, but do you know what I mean like this? Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to support the surprise for any men in the room, but that's not how we do it. <laughs> no woman gets home from work and goes, oh, ten minutes till the midsummer murders. <laughs> I'm just going to the blind. <laughs> The guy can start singing, gets to the good bit of the song, two women will appear either side of him and go. Thank you. I also have 
say thank you to the staff, Judith, Dan, Claire, um, Mel, Sean. Uh, thank you so much for your support because I couldn't do this work without your support. So thank you to, to all the staff who, who allow me, fill in for me and come for me so that I can do this sort of work. And, and my sexual health colleagues as well, where are they? There they are. <laughs> I bet you're looking forward to doing smear tomorrow. This is a tech case of life. Anyway, that's it for me.